So if paparazzi <laughs> flew over your own house and they caught you at your most vulnerable in your own private residence, what would that be? We have to assume I have some sense of shame. As someone who's who's gone out like buck naked out into the world, not caring, I don't know what 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 there would be to shame me. I dare <laughs> say I'm bulletproof. <laughs> you are bulletproof. So yeah. on that note. Welcome back to Not A Strong Start, a podcast by filmmakers to talk movies, television, and are bulletproof against any drama. I'm your host, me versus I. I am not your host, Filmality. And I'm just a big blue guy who fell for a girl. Yeah, you are. So <laughs> yeah. that, that, that doesn't even pertain to the episode. That's just in general. <laughs> yeah, just a big just my guy. life. Yes. <laughs> blue, blue, baba diba. <laughs> I like how we start this. We just start having normal conversations. As soon as I go into the intro, you guys are like, okay, let's see what Dan has now. <laughs> but on this week's episode, we're going to be talking about battles, not just any battles, but battles of the premise, the same similar premises, ideas, movies that had similar. What is it? Premise, I guess. Is, is that what we're yeah, premise themes? Uh, you know, and it was kind of discussing which movie did it better. Like, who did that theme better? No, just like if we go against anybody else as a podcast, we did it better. (laughs) Damn straight. But first, we're going (laughs) to hit you with our current event. So Blue Beetle is coming out. You know, the trailer came out, what, a couple of months ago. There was a little hype behind it. Mm -hmm. But is it just me or has this been some of the worst marketing there is for a movie? There's like nothing being put out there for this movie at all after that first trailer and considering this is supposed to be the first movie that takes place in the next DC uh, DCU you would think there'll be a little more push and a little more like hey you know we have some diversity in this movie you know we got multiple like his Hispanic stuff uh it's the first character let's introduce this right but I'm not seeing a lot what, what are you guys seeing? Wait, Jose, so you're saying Latinos are being oppressed in this movie? <laughs> That's never happened. Por qué? Por qué? <laughs> I'm, color me shocked. I've never seen that happen. It does seem weird, though, because James Gunn, like, he should be promoting this. So it's almost like, are you setting this up to fail? I've noticed know. that ever since uh, Wonder Woman 84... And that failure, every movie after has had little to to no advertisement. Because you think of like the Suicide Squad by James Gunn, mm-hmm. the the Shazam movie, like all those things came out, and like there was really nothing for it. There's barely a trailer here or there. I barely saw any like posters or ads on different you uh, media sites. There was like nothing. Mm-hmm. Then it just mm-hmm. happened. Like I honestly, I would have forgot to watch Shazam when we went to go visit you guys in L.A. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't, I think like Mike brought it up or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, otherwise, I didn't really care. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, I think the Flash is the only one that's probably gotten the heaviest promotion. I guess probably maybe because the budget was so um, bloated, but even then, it still came in at a two hundred million dollar loss. So, and continuing to lose. Yes. Yeah. It's it's weird because okay, at least I can sort of understand those movies because they already knew that this is coming to the end. This one. Even though it's not the Superman's the one that's supposed to really kickstart the DCU uh, in the saga in that first story arc that they're gonna do, this one takes place in that new world. Like you would think, you would want people to get their eyes on it and kind of get a feel. So it just kind of gives me a bad feeling that did they see it and be like, no, let's not waste money on promotion and marketing on this. Like we're probably already gonna lose a lot of money. You'd figure they'd want to do something like with the Batman. Like the Batman had decent actually promotion. You know what? I should take it back. The Batman came out after Wonder Woman. That had decent yeah. promotion behind it. And maybe because it's Batman. Batman's the exception. You know? Mm-hmm. But they did really cool things where like there was stuff online that tied to the Riddler, where like you're able oh, to like yeah. solve the riddle and cool. and see like the secret website and everything. I don't know why they're not doing more stuff like that. You know, they 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 should this is where they should copy Marvel. The MCU mm. does a really good thing when it comes to promoting their stuff outside of media and TV. Like they had for She-Hulk, the actress who played Titania, like she was mm. going around spray painting her name over She-Hulk posters. And then that was getting posted on her social media and that kind of went viral. It's like, that's a really cool thing. Even for the, the secret invasion, there's been people dressed up as scrolls and going out into the world. That's cool. Do stuff like that. 
dressed up as squirrel squirrels. As, as squirrels. <laughs> yeah. They're getting squirrely. <laughs> <laughs> Running around all willy nilly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that that kind of stuff is like really fun for the public and it gets them more into it. I don't know why that that's to me it's even low level stuff. It doesn't take much to do those kind of advertisements as yeah. opposed to like billboards and commercials which can cost thousands of that thousands of dollars i mean in the end i hope it's i hope it's good and i hope it it, it needs to be both it needs to be good and it needs to do well hopefully the cobra kai and uh people step up and uh hispanics step up and go take a look because we don't have too many chances to lead these type of movies so let's Let's not mess it up the first time. Get into our main topic then. So we're going to be talking about Battle of the Movies. Which one do we like? Who did it better? Basically, you know, when you see a person walk up in the exact, same exact outfit that you had at the party, it's like, hey, <laughs> we shot for the same place. Who wore it better? So the first one, undercover cop who ends up caring for the band of thieves that he goes undercover with. Who did it better? On one end, we got Point Break. Versus Fast in the Furious, Paul Walker. Who did it better? We'll start with you on this one, Dan. All right. And then, so... hey, I will preface it with saying this, this isn't about what's the better movie. It's who did that theme better, that premise okay. better. Okay. So, and it's like a twofold question because if you're talking about success, well, Fast and the Furious has like a 10. 10 part movie but <laughs> we're gonna ignore that part because yeah. i felt point break was the better film and the reason why i'll argue about this is that despite the fact that fast and the fury has had 10 different movies of this it's because they had a theme and a tone of the movie and it completely went away from what it was whereas point break knew what it was it came out it was super over the top 80s cheesy it is what it is and it's become so cult so classic that even with the fast and the furious fans you don't hear them preaching about the first one was so amazing they talk about the last ones and how ridiculous it is so even for the fans of the first fast and the furious they're not fans of the latest fast and the fear like those are two different groups of people that are liking this so for that argument i'm gonna say point break because i liked it more i mean this was this even a debate honestly it's it like dan said it's it's point break and to, to add to that point it's like when when top people talk about Fast and the Furious, they're talking about moments, and like, oh man, that ridiculous thing that they did with the car, or that ridiculous thing when they punched the missile, that ridiculous thing when they went to space. You know, it's always something ridiculous. Point Break was such a grounded relationship between Patrick Swayze and Keanu Reeves and everything they went through. Like, I think it was directed by Catherine Bigelow, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like the Hurt Locker. This is a person who knows how to direct a movie. It's like you're not just getting some action film you're actually getting a good character piece in there which is something coming from me who i will always say keanu reeves is not necessarily the best actor but he is the best person for a hit movie like yes. he just has good chemistry with people that's just mm -hmm. undeniable and like you feel their friendship i'm sorry i didn't feel like freaking uh, toretto and this guy were really friends <laughs> you know? yeah. i never felt that in any movie yeah because they yeah. weren't friends. They were the family. family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I feel, okay, the theme itself, I feel they both did an okay job, but I'm going to have to go with Point Break on doing it better because, like you said, the the friendship between, you know, Keanu's character and Swayze's character, that's kind of what caused, you know, the second guessing by the undercover cop and, and the caring. While in Fast and the Furious... I don't think he really did it for Dom. It was more for the love of the sister, of Dom's sister. And that what was driving them. I think if the sister wasn't in the picture, we might not see Walker being as lenient for, with Dom. And we might have gotten a completely different movie. So on that aspect, I feel the theme was done better in Point Break. That's true. And they really explored the more cop world in Point Break, whereas Fast and the Fears, he just told us he was an undercover cop. Right. Like we didn't really yeah. see the world of that. There was no threat of the police necessarily. You know, we did in Point Break, like it was an actual theme. Like we got it. Yeah, it's Fast and the Furious is not about the racing. The reality is the first movie, it's about the cars. Yeah, the cars exactly. are showcased while in mm -hmm. Point Break. It's like, no, the bank heist, like you said, the, the cops, their relationship. Mm -hmm. That's yep. that's the thing. 
And even the stakes are higher. I mean, in the first, I mean, of course, we're, we're not thinking about the other Fast and the Furious or anything like that. But in this one, what was it DVDs, VCRs? That's that's what, what they were taking. So <laughs> stakes were a little different on that one. <laughs> it's a, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to send someone undercover to catch a DVD. Thief, like it's well, like, the whole pirated you know the warning about the pirated they got to get yeah. it from somewhere <laughs> that's how it all started that's when they send in the paul walkers like, okay. yeah <laughs> okay next theme is who's human who's not I feel this one's gonna be a little tougher on one end we have invasion of the body snatchers and i'm thinking original here uh and then we have the thing on the other end Two movies where characters had to wonder, are you human or are you not human? Okay, I'm glad you... I meant to ask earlier which body snatchers since there's been an umpteenth amount of makes of these. So so the one with the first one, okay. Because I would say the one with the... Uh, what's his name? Sutherland. Donald Sutherland Donald. is probably the one that, I go to to watch the most. Was that yeah. like the, the 70... The yeah, 70s the, one, yeah. yeah. Let's like go with that one. That one's the best one. one. By that point? Yeah. Yeah, let's go with but, that one. I feel that one's the best one. It is the better one to watch. Yeah. You know, yeah. but even that being said, I'm still going to go with the thing as the one that, that did it better. Just because every Body Snatchers film, the the replacements always felt like robots. Mm -hmm. They never felt like true representations of the original person. Mm -hmm. While with the thing, even the, the thing that was re replacing the person wasn't sure. They didn't mm -hmm. know. If they like you got that sense at times of like, oh snap, I'm the thing. Oh no. <laughs> you know, and, then, and then it turns into the monster. Like, yeah. Like, it was like, me equal, all along. It's equally surprised. <laughs> and so like them having that surprise is, was big for us as the viewer. You know, plus it adds the whole body horror inside of it and everything. And the fact that at the very end it still keeps you guessing of like who's who is one of them? Are they both? Is neither one? I I don't know. No, 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 no one knows, you know. While with the other one, it's like, nah, you kind of figure it out. I, I can tell. It's like, <laughs> you have no personality. You're the... <laughs> <laughs> you sit funny. It's you. <laughs> I, I'm just like this. This is me normally. <laughs> <laughs> just a bland person with no personality. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> Which makes sense. They all come out of pea pods. It's like, yeah, you're a freaking vegetable. Make, yeah, vegetables are yeah. boring. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what about you, Dan? Damn vegans. <laughs> but no, it's a great point what you're saying, George, because they are two different creatures, right? They're two different aliens, essentially. So you have one that's imitating people versus one that infects a person. So that's why you're seeing it. But I mean, the thing all day, man. And and I'm going to say specifically the Kurt Russell one. Like, that's my favorite. That's the go to one. I'm assuming it's everybody's favorite as well. But the thing is awesome. It's like because it's it's like what you said. You don't know who. It adds a great stakes, a great uh scenery that you have them in. They're locked up in the snow, one location, man versus beast, man versus animal, man versus wild. Okay, so mine is gonna be the thing too, but I feel like I gotta give some love to the body snatchers also. Mm -hmm. Um because one thing that the body snatchers had, the thing that didn't have was just the the sheer numbers aspect of it. So when they're going out there. And unless they're fully interacting with people, when they're trying to get help, trying to make it out of the city, they don't know at that point is like a hundred percent of the people now, you know, body snatched or, you know, how can I pick out or where can I find the people that can help me that are not? So there's a sheer numbers aspect of it. While the thing, you know, it's, it's a small, you know, you had one <laughs> that's, that's there. So it's like, okay, we just have to worry about finding one. Well, the other one is like we have to find it's like a needle in a haystack to actually find a human who's not contaminated. So I will give that to the body snatchers. I feel that was the strength of it. But it's going to be the thing in the end. Uh, mainly, I won't rehash for the reasons that you guys gave, especially the fact that sometimes even the thing was so good that it, it seemed like they didn't even know that they were the ones infected. And in essence, we were also confused as an audience as who it can be. Like I, I probably would have just burned everybody alive. But I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> uh, every everyone goes. Oh, you spoke fire. And it, and it was you <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh oh damn it! <laughs> killing me, George. <laughs> Moving on to the next one. When movies become real, on one <laughs> end we have 
Last Action Hero with Schwarzenegger. And then we have Wes Craven's New Nightmare with Robert England. Two movies where the movies within the movies become reality. I'm going to give a little bit of love to Last Action Hero, okay? Even though my answer is New Nightmare, obvious reasons. But Last Action Hero was fun. It was really smart, the concept that they brought to this, because what Schwarzenegger was doing at the time wasn't so meta i guess in a certain way we haven't really seen this approach necessarily to to we definitely never seen this approach to an action movie where you kind of break that fourth wall but new nightmare what they did with horror it was so brilliant how we tied in it was like the original scream in the sense like what we've talked about is where you tie in the characters into the movie it it also broke down the fourth wall and became very meta to us i just thought it was so interesting what wes craven did for this and the fact that he was able to do this and to do scream solidifies him in my opinion as like the king of horror at least you know director standpoint but a new nightmare it's it's one of my favorite freddy movies like i just thought it was really clever how he did this and how he tied into it it had a lot of good horror moments that we didn't necessarily see with Freddy, but I love the idea of the character not knowing what's real, what's not, and then bleeding into the movie and the fabrication that they had created in the world of what we saw. I'm actually going to surprise you right now. We're not all going to have the same answer. We're hey! <laughs> okay. And George with a curveball. This one tore me up, Jose. <laughs> it really I was right did. There with you. It, I was right there with it you. Did. It freaking hit me. I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because seeing what Night New Nightmare, I was like, oh, I'm gonna pick that, duh. And I was like, but damn, Last Action Hero was a really fun movie. And Very. I broke it down in my head. The reality is, I've watched Last Action Hero a thousand times more than I've watched New Nightmare. Mm-hmm. Because New Nightmare is not my go-to Freddy movie. As much as as Agreed. good as it is, yeah, it's not the it's one. Not. I I'm gonna I go agree. to Dream Warriors every time. Mm-hmm. You know, so it, it's it's much lower on my list. Because at, at the end of the day, it's like both are doing a similar thing where. They're taking familiar scenes that you've seen in movies and replicating them. But how are you changing it? New Nightmare didn't really change any kills that we've seen in the past. They were the same kills, new location, you know, new victim. But what the last action hero did, it took things and elevated it. Like there's a scene that sticks out in my head forever where like there's a guy who's thrown into an ice cream truck and the ice cream truck explodes for no reason. There's a, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not like they shot at the gas tank. No, no, the guy's just thrown into the ice cream truck, and it it blows up, and then an ice cream cone goes in the back of a henchman's head, and he's killed by an ice cream cone. It's this over the top ridiculousness. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you picked that death because I love that death so. Much. It's so good. Yeah, <laughs> Michael Bay's favorite scene. Yeah, it better yes. be. Yeah, <laughs> I think at that time, what does Arnold say? Because he's a, it, there's so many one liners from Arnold. Yeah. This was him showing, like, I'm the king of one-liners. I think he's like, ice that guy, uh, cone the phrase, so he had a double whammy. <laughs> and the henchman who dies is, like, the Asian henchman in every movie. This this one, it was a tough choice. I mean, you know I'm a Freddy fan, so I'm going, like, back and forth between it. Um, I do feel Last Action Hero was the more fun interpretation of the scene, of course. Um for me personally, I do feel Wes Kramer's new nightmare uh, up the ante when it came to that theme with a premise. Uh, because with like Last Action Hero, they come into the real world. And yes, they are themselves. They are the real characters. But now they're living under real world rules. So they're technically just regular humans uh, at that point, just living in the real world and, and being the characters. While in Wes Kramer's new nightmare, you know, he brought his world into the new world all of a sudden so that that increases the stakes of that premise on top of that with it being in that world where you know they they've been working on this movie and and you know it's all supernatural and horror and all of that stuff it can be easy for someone to believe like okay you've been working on this movie so much you've gotten so much of the character that you're seeing things you're hallucinating you know maybe you just need some rest you're overworked so it's I, it's such a great twist on like you can see why it would be hard for people to believe that that is happening even the people themselves and that 
is mainly the reason why I had to go towards New Nightmare is they did the concept, but on a higher level with a higher stakes and they executed it well. I would say, because you mentioned the fact that with Action Hero, that they go to the real world. But Schwarzenegger's character of Slater doesn't go to the real world until like the last 10 minutes of the movie. Most of the movie is the kid being in the movie world. So the kid thinks he knows everything about the movie world, but little by little, he's he's realizing like, oh, snap, like not everything's what I thought it was. And like he thinks, well, I'm with the action hero. I'm safe. Then there's that moment where he realizes like, oh, no, wait, I'm the comic relief. I can get hurt. I can die because I'm not the hero. And like that's a big moment for him to realize as someone who's real being in this imaginary world. And then eventually in that last 10 minutes, Slater's been invincible for like an hour and 20 minutes. And now all of a sudden he's getting shot. He's getting stabbed. Like he's seeing his own blood. It's like, whoa, what's going on here? What's <laughs> yeah. So I felt like that was a good flip having like the real world person experience the imaginary and have that broken for them. And then the other vice versa, where the imaginary guy is now experiencing what reality feels like. I thought that was a really cool take on that. As for for an action movie that's usually not going to have depth, yeah, you know, those were interesting takes. I felt definitely was that that was a good twist. Like I said, this was hard for me picking between both. Yeah, of them you're a bastard. They, they both, yeah, <laughs> heartless, heartless. Some would say yeah. a heartless bastard. <laughs> they both, they both do the theme, the premise, uh, differently, but they both do it well. And I think with this, it comes down to a preference of like, okay, which one did you prefer? And then, you know, the, maybe the Freddy bias kicked in a little bit. Maybe the horror bias kicked in a little bit. But that execution of the premise, I have to put on top of the last action year old myself. Next one, the next theme. Beware of the kids. All right. We got on one end, Village of the Dam. And the other one, Children of the Corn. I've seen both Village of the Dam, but I went with the Christopher Reeves one on this one because I figured that probably matches up better with the tone and feel with mm -hmm. any Children of the Corn movie we're going to go with. That being said, I still want Children of the Corn just because I felt like I've watched it a bit more on a psychological level. There's something a little bit more deeper and terrifying of the idea of these kids who are in this cult. You know, it's like, and it's what this is what it looks like if adults aren't around, as opposed mm -hmm. to like Children of the Dam. It's like, well, this is an adult situation. These kids were born with powers. Mm -hmm. It's like they're pretty much little gods. That's different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, scary still, you know, but at the same time, like, I just felt like there's something about the child without nurture that that has no guidance and it just kind of like loses it. And like, I, the, the character of Isaac, I always hated him. Like I still till this day, like just hearing his voice of like it's such up here and <laughs> like, it, it got at me every time. I was like, oh, kill that kid. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I never felt that that urge with any of the, the children of the dam. They're just like, they're just there. That, their that, <laughs> that feeling that he gave me is the same feeling that I got from one other character in the future. And it was Joffrey. They both gave me the yes. same feeling. They had the same eyes. <laughs> yes, they did. I ended up going Village of the Dam with Christopher Reeves. But I preface this by saying, although I've seen both movies and I've enjoyed both movies, I don't love both movies. I don't go back and rewatch them. And so that's why when I'm looking at them, it was kind of a hard decision because one doesn't scream that I love it. Um, I'm kind of going with the one where I'm like, okay, this one I, I guess was more interesting to me. Uh, the the Children of the Corn, it's interesting about how they left without parents, but it felt kind of grimy, very dirty. And I've mentioned before about how I don't particularly love those type of movies, like that kind of uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is kind the of- The ones you like can smell? Yeah, the ones you can <laughs> smell. And that one feels like that. Village of the Damned remind me of that Twilight Zone episode, you know, with the kid with the powers. Yeah. So that's a little more interesting to me. Um, the fact that that even the parent, if well, actually, it, it kind of seemed like they kind of bit that storyline and they just multiply the children because he had to act a certain way around the children and he couldn't, you know. So it was it had more of a sci fi element to it uh, for me. But. Again, I prefaced it by saying it wasn't an obvious answer. I had to go also Village of the Dam, and there was just this one glaring reason why I had to go with Village of the Dam is I was like, okay, if I was to get put in both of these scenarios, I probably 
would be more cautious and more like scared in the village of the dam scenario with these power kids who can just kill us at any moment. And then I think Children of the Corn, it was like, grab a belt and like, we'll take care of these kids. Like, <laughs> go get the chancla. You know, it just, I feel like they never felt like a threat to me at all. Like, they were kind of annoying in the whole way. Yeah. Well, Village of the Dam, they actually felt like a threat. So I think that beware of the kid is stronger in the way as it was executed in the village of the dam. Going to the next one. Next. Frame, framed and on the run. And we got two good movies here. This was a little tough for me personally. We got The Fugitive, Harrison Ford. And the other one we have Minority Report, Tom Cruise. Two people that were framed and had to go on the run and try to prove their innocence. Who did it better? All right. So this one's the exact opposite problem that I had in the last one. <laughs> Meaning <laughs> I love both these movies and I love them in very, very different ways. This is one of my favorite Harrison Ford movies is The Fugitive. And him and Tommy Lee Jones, the old, uh, I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. But then you see Minority Report, and it's like I freaking love this Spielberg movie, and it's and then Colin Farrell you have with uh, you know Tom Cruise. So man, I just it's really really hard. But Minority Report's the one I go back to more. So I guess I have to give the nod to that one. But in my opinion, the Fugit the Fugitive had better acting. But I'm probably gonna give it Minority Report. But I know it's a it can really go either way. Um, I just I'm a little more of a sci fi fan and it's just the visual world, the sci fi. It had really good special effects. It painted a very realistic world. And I, I always love kind of jumping into the future. So I guess I go minority for it. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> George, like the, at every point you just made. I mean, pretty much like I, I will say for me, I probably wasn't as diehard for the fugitive as Dan is. I admit it's a good movie. It's really, you know. Mm -hmm definitely one of the better uh Harrison Ford films but it's not one I would ever go back to often you know it was, it was good for what it was mm -hmm. but Minority Report like it's got everything yeah. <laughs> you know literally that's yeah. that's the great thing about a Tom Cruise and Spielberg film is that you're getting action film and there's good acting and there's a good story it's like oh how are you gonna beat that <laughs> you know I wouldn't consider Fugitive like the biggest on action per se it, it definitely is more about the who done it and the chase but with Minority Report, like, there's there's so many good things. First, for people don't know, I have a big eye phobia. Like, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. even look at myself, like, try to go near my eye. It bothers the crap out of me. That's why I got these bad boys. So that scene in there where he has his eyes pulled out, it eats me up. But the movie's so good, I watch it still every time. <laughs> I force myself to go through that moment. Just so I can just feel it's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. But I love every bit of that movie. I, there's the, the technology with the freaking hands and moving things around and stuff like that. Oh, the little spider things too. Yeah. Oh, everything was so good. Like it's just a visual spectacle. Plus, you got Mo uh, Max von Sado as the bad guy. I mean, come on. How are you going to go wrong wrong with that? <laughs> can't. can't. I'm, I'm going to be the different one here. Uh, oh, I, I, love, I love Minority Report. If I had to, if you had to put both movies in front of me and be like, hey, which one do you prefer to watch? It's going to be Minority Port 100% of the time. Um, you know, it's one of my favorite sci-fi like action movies. But just going straight on the premise itself, I have to go with Fugitive because the cat and mouse game be between the two characters made that on the run and frame aspect a lot better for me. Colin Farrell was, you know, good in Minority Report, but it was the Tom Cruise show. Like, you know, it's just what is Tom Cruise going to do? What is his character doing stuff? Here, it was like, ooh, back and forth. He does something. He does something. He does something. Oh, he just missed them. And I feel that made the on the run aspects so interesting. That's why I have to go with The Fugitive, even though I'm a bigger fan of the Minority Report movie. That's fair. And it gave us the whole yeah. the one arm man. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so good, man. But just that action sequence of the train as it's chasing Harrison Ford and he's running with the handcuffs as his ankles are 
it's just it's so good. So even when when it's Minority Report has more action scenes, but Fugitive is more far and fewer. But when you get them, they are great and they're impactful and it almost makes it bigger in a sense because you don't get them so, you know, as, as frequently. Yeah. And the, the sh- it's true. The shots in Fugitive were also replicated so many times, like through either parody or other films like that, that tunnel scene when he jumps mm-hmm. off towards like the, the fall. Mm-hmm. How many times have we seen that scene put in so many other food with films? All right, for the next one, and this actually kind of goes with uh, it goes with Dan's uh, name. It's um, <laughs> you are me and I am you. We got on one end the family friendly Freaky Friday, on the other end not so family friendly Face Off. Oh, face off is Two. all about family. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Two movies that did it in completely different ways. Okay, this was this was actually another hard one, believe it or not. Only because I believe that Freaky Friday has the better premise, in the sense of like you're being you have no matter which way you're taken, uh, the original or the remake, you have a child who becomes an adult, an adult who becomes a child. That's a certain physical feeling. That you that person has to go through that's gonna be pretty unique and different, as opposed to face off, just their faces are being changed. They still have the same bodies within the, the movies, you know. So it's like, are they really going through anything special? No. Their surroundings might feel different because of who they're portraying, but the idea of being a different body, it's like that's imagine being young again, you know, or now all of a sudden you're old. It's like, well, damn, that sucks. But the reality is, face off is just a much better move. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm gonna watch Face Off once a year, and that's not gonna stop. I'm gonna watch Freaky <laughs> Friday once every twenty years, <laughs> Sorry. which I guess I'm due. Yeah, I, I'm with George on this. This is kind of hard to really quantify because Freaky Friday, at least the original Freaky Friday, was one of the first ones that kind of pioneered the whole body switching. Then it, then there was so so many replications that we've seen uh, you know versions of this movie that was just done so many times so it feels less original but it was one of the first ones to ever do it which tells you that the premise was that interesting face off if i was to pitch to you face off without you knowing who you know <laughs> john travolta or knowing nicholas cage is in it and i just pitched it to you you would laugh and just think it's such a stupid idea then you see the movie in the execution, and, and now you still laugh, but and you're still right. laugh, you're laughing even more, saying, "You know what? I was wrong. This is genius." So, <laughs> I'm, I yeah, Face Off. I watched so many times. I watch it way more. So it's kind of hard to say. Okay, so how are we ranking this based off of the better movie? Are we ranking off of the better film? Because uh, Freaky Friday oh, technically. Which one do you feel did the uh, the uh swapping the you are me and i am you premise better which one do you which okay execution do you prefer fair enough that premise i'm gonna go face okay. off and the reason why is because because of what george said yes they just swap faces but then the actors and the characters had to try to act like the other one it, it it wasn't just oh we swap bodies and now we just have to deal with each other's lives we actually have to incorporate this and now i'm undercover and it, it, there was more to face off and it's just you know you throw in the action they're balancing a lot more there's more themes in the movie so i go face off yeah. okay i take it back it's freaky friday <laughs> 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 uh, only because of what you just said jose the fact that it the reality is jody foster in the original freaky friday has to pretend to be an adult and she's a child she's like not even really a teenager yet and she pulls off being an adult very, very well. well very well which most child actors couldn't Mm-hmm. And I'll even give it to Lindsay Lohan. She didn't do a bad job, too. But Jodie Foster, the OG. I mean, she, she's act, she's an actress. She's a, f- a full-on actor. I didn't feel like John Travolta became Nicolas Cage or vice versa. <laughs> <I didn't... laughs> the reality is they stayed, they stayed the same people. They stay exactly the same. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I was to judge off of movie preference, it's a landslide face-off. Because I'm not going off a of movie preference. It's a closer matchup, but it still goes to face off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and the, the the reason is again, it comes down to the states of the execution of it. So you know, here you had 
two characters who they're not family, they're not friends, they're enemies that know each other so well that when they do the switch, you know, they have to try to basically incorporate themselves into the other person's lives where if they mess up and they get discovered, that's for one, it's probably their life. They'll get killed. And then for the other one, he's going to jail in there. So, you know, in Freaky Friday, one of them mess up. They'd be like, okay, that person's just weird. Like, that's it. It's not that big of a deal. But here, it's like life and death within that premise and the fact that they have to do that. And it's not someone that they're close to overall. And they have to try to pretend that person, to be that person. So that's why I would go with Face Off as my preferred execution of that premise. All right, going on to the next one. Evil house pet. On the one we have Cujo. On the other hand, we have Pet Cemetery. This one was very hard because Cujo is such a very interesting concept and way more believable. It seemed very, very realistic that this could have happened. Uh, pet Cemetery is just one that I go back to. And I know we've had debates before whether Pet Cemetery is good or not. <laughs> so I already know <laughs> what Jose is going to say. <laughs> um, I like Pet Cemetery, but it did have obvious flaws to it. Cujo's good, but it, do it doesn't have a lot of high rewatchability for me personally because there's a lot of drawn kind of boring moments. So I guess I'm going to go Pet Cemetery just because it had a lot of like quotable lines and things like that. But man, but Cujo is believable. It's more believable. I'm, I'm gonna jump in here first, George, because Dan is trying me out on this. So take it away. <laughs> I'm about to go with Cujo. <laughs> sure. Surprise, surprise. What? <laughs> I can't go pet cemetery because what did the cat do? It literally was just like always like Meh. and I was like, yeah. but he, he wouldn't do anything. He would just like pop up a air a hairball in like a corner, <laughs> you know. Shit in your Cujo shoe. was getting things done. He was, you know. Tearing at doors and, and wiping out people. He wasn't just there growling wiping the entire time people. that he appeared. You know, <laughs> all the pet guy, yeah, he was a zombie cat, but he was, what was he doing that's different than a regular cat who just wants to be an a hole? Right? <laughs> no. That's why I went with Cujo on this. Torch, take it away. Uh, to back up Jose on his thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Cujo. Cujo's is the obvious choice just because if we're going by the premise idea what is more scary right the idea of a of freaking Saint Bernard which is practically a bear dog they're scary on their own never mind if it has freaking bat rabies mm. all right that's a, that's a terrifying beast that's going to try to kill you <laughs> in the pet cemetery there's easy ways to stop this I can kick a cat I can punt a child you know, it's yeah. like here's some other things don't bury them at the pet cemetery <laughs> you know who, what i, I changed my that? answer let's go to saint bernard with the coronavirus let's i, I really want to know even as a child watching pet cemetery i was like who the hell buries their pet at a cemetery like you bury humans at a cemetery because you're going to visit the grave and it's a it's a person that you is in your family it's blood i'm not going to go to the cemetery to visit my 10th cat what, what no. is this what is you flush <laughs> them down the toilet like a normal human being yeah meat <laughs> grinder we having sausage tonight i mean come on guys <laughs> <laughs> Well, it looks like uh, Cujo takes that one. Yeah. All right. And for our last one, the premise of who am I again? And on one end, we have Total Recall, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Born Identity. Another, another challenging one, man. Jose freaking is putting the gun to our heads on this. I, I, I went with Total Recall at the end. I mean, it almost feels obvious. That's probably what I was going to pick. As much as I like Born Identity and it's a good action film, and it definitely brought in the whole quick cuts action scene stuff. I mean, Total Recall is just the it's the, it's the go to, you know, and I, I'll still watch that movie like over some time and I'll, I'll give it the time that it deserves. So I can I can have that feeling of like, who, who is Quaid? What's going on here? And it just has the better visuals. It's the better, better concept. Are they in space? Are they really on Mars? All that all that, that is in question. While with the other one, it's like, OK, it's just, you know. Spy games, espionage stuff. You'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. So, Born Identity, very solid. Great. I would say, you know Dan's about to say something when he goes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, okay. Uh, the, the chef's hands are coming up now. <laughs> yeah. like, 
I, I appreciate what Matt Damon did, all right? Yeah. But Total Recall all day, every day, man. Like, it was such an overly intelligent movie for Arnold Schwarzenegger at that time. Like, when, when you watch the movie, forget about the fact that it's Arnold playing this and you have the ridiculous, as <laughs> ripping them apart. Like, it's a real movie. And the concept and even the ending, you still don't really quite know, like, was he there? Was he not? Like, it's so smart it's such a smart concept and not to mention how many memorable lines and scenes and the eyes bugging out when he's in there with the mars thing and the girl with the three titties <laughs> <laughs> they gave us so much i love total recall and i go back to it at least every couple years like total recall all day is easy, easy answer for me this this was tough at first because i do enjoy both movies and i I believe they both executed their version of it, of this premise, right? I have to give it a total recall because with Jason Bourne, he doesn't know who he is. Everyone else knows who he is and we know who he is. There's no mystery except for Jason Bourne himself. He could just ask us. We'll tell him who he is. (laughs) (laughs) With uh, Total Recall, especially the first, you know, the first time you watch that movie, for most of the movie, is we don't know who the hell he is like okay which version is the real version of him so it's like we we don't know he doesn't know who really knows uh and i feel that adds an element that jason Bourne did not have when it comes to this premise so i i would have to go with total recall for that reason and it's got more and fun how many deaths. times don't you watch total recall and think to yourself dude just stay with sharon stone just yeah. live that life, man. Yeah. Live that- <laughs> you got Sharon Stone, man. Or or even the the in the remake, the it, it was it was right? Kate Beckinsale. Yeah, like, live your best yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> Not the end of the day. Screw you, Benny. Yeah. <laughs> I, love I love Arnold, man. Yeah, total recall. So I hope you guys had as much fun as we did talking about these. <laughs> Let us know in the comments which ones you prefer. Please like, subscribe, comment, share at our YouTube channel, Not A Strong Start. You can listen to us anywhere you listen to your podcast. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram and threads. And Not A Strong Start. Uh, hey! hey. hey. I'm cool your host. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> me versus I. You can follow me at King underscore Sangre. I am not your host, Filmality. You can find me at This Is Me Nombre on Instagram. And I'm still just a big blue guy who fell for a girl. You can follow me at Nicolopolis. (laughs) 